All right, in this lecture, we're gonna be introducing the Racket programming language, and I'm gonna be demonstrating how to use the Dr. Racket programming environment. Racket is the main programming language we're gonna be learning and really using to construct most of our code throughout this course. And learning Racket is really a significant part of the course. Um, a big part of teaching you about how to learn programming languages is really just having you wrap your mind around a fairly nice general purpose one that's well built and has a fairly minimal set of components. All right, so a few high-level facts about Racket. So unlike Haskell, which is another popular functional programming language that's strongly typed, Racket is dynamically typed. It's a descendant of the programming language scheme, which was developed at MIT, kind of a cleaner and smaller version of the original uh, language Lisp, which is a sort of older language back from kind of the late 60s. So the language is also very functional. It really emphasizes a functional programming style. Uh, it's compositional. We design functions to sort of work and play well together so we can build bigger and bigger pieces out of smaller pieces without having to worry about their implementation details leaking between them. And Racket also very uh, highly emphasizes immutability. Immutability is this notion that objects don't fundamentally change. You can only sort of create new versions of them and pass those new versions around. And when you use immutability as your default, you just get a lot cleaner and more pure kind of code that you can reason about very simply. And I hope to demonstrate that throughout the course. And then last, uh, one thing that I really do like about Racket, especially versus uh, pure functional programming languages like Haskell, is that Racket is impure. And so when you really do need to use uh, setbang, it is possible to use it, although we actually will be explicitly forbidding you from using any of the mutable features of Racket uh, till fairly farly into the course. So here are some of the features of Racket that we're actually not going to talk very much about in the course. Um, and so our goal is to get you to understand Racket as a programming language. We're going to completely explain a subset of Racket. Racket also includes a whole bunch of other features that we're just not going to discuss. So Racket is actually a family of programming languages, and it's a toolkit for building new languages in a kind of Racket-like style, where you can use syntax transformers and macros to build up very expressive programs with many different thousands of forms, just starting from a regular small kind of consistent base syntax that is encapsulated by S expressions. We also say, and this is something that people really harp on a bunch when they talk about Lisp, um, that the language is what is called homoiconic. And homoiconicity is just a property of a programming language that means the syntax of the programming language is the same structure as the way that the data in the language is actually represented. So if you think about languages like C and C++ and even Java, those languages, the code is sort of a separate stratified thing. You use a compiler, you turn the code into some binary, and then it's sitting in a special portion of the memory and executing. In Racket, the actual data structure that you know is actually comprises the program is represented at runtime, and theoretically, you could generate new syntax that then would be um, sort of interpreted on the fly. So uh, let's start with just a small example of some Racket code right here. I've got this little calculate slope function. I'm going to load this up into uh, Dr. Racket, which is a programming environment and the IDE for coding in Racket. Uh, and you can see that we've got this little pound laying Racket thing right here at the very top. And that just says that I'm going to actually program in the Racket programming language. Racket is actually a programming ecosystem. There are a bunch of different languages, but we're going to teach you just a subset of the Racket language through this course. All right, so let's copy and paste in this little function right here, this calculate slope function. Now, here's the first thing um, that's sort of obvious about Racket, which is that there are parentheses everywhere. All right, so we have parentheses before the form define. This is saying we're going to define a function named calculate slope, since it's the first thing in this parentheses here. And then it's going to accept four parameters, x0, y0, x1, and y1. All right, and so this is defining a function. The reason it's defining a function is that anytime we have something of the form define f of x followed by some other variables and then some body right here, this is a function definition in Racket. All right, and so here we're saying define the calculate slope function on the variables x0, y0, x1, and y1. 
All right, and we're saying that we're going to define the function. What's the function's body? Well, here's one thing that's also a little bit different than maybe some other programming languages. And that's that in the body here, you'll see there's not an explicit return statement. So in some programming languages, specifically, for example, C++, you have to explicitly return a value and jump back to the position where you were called. In Racket, there's always kind of an implicit return, which is just the fact that you're always building up a value. The result of every sub-expression in Racket always computes to some value, and that value is the thing that will always get returned if it's just kind of the end of the function. And this kind of emphasizing and mirroring the purely functional style that Racket tries to adopt by default. And so this says, divide the result of y1 minus y0 by the result of x1 minus x0 and says then return that, uh, that, that the result of that division to whoever called this function. All right. So now I can finally run calculate slope on 0, 0, 0099 and I get the result 1. All right, so what was different about the code that we saw in Racket just now than code we might write in another functional programming language? So first of all, every function in Racket, no matter what the function is, even if it's a built-in function like plus, minus, or append, or something like that, every function is called using prefix notation. And this makes Racket extremely uniform in its syntax. Because if you have a list of expressions that is not explicitly quoted, we'll talk about what that is in a few more minutes, but if you just have a list of expressions that are something like f of x, y, z, you can always identify that the first thing in that list is the thing that you're calling. All right, and so here we're seeing this prefix notation. We're saying divide y1 minus y0 by x1 minus x0. And when you take this style where you write everything out very explicitly, in Racket, you always have to use the parentheses. So for example, I can write, um, if I try to write 2 plus 3 in Racket, it will just tell me you've written three separate things, the number 2, the function plus, and then 3. If I try to do 2 plus 3 like this, Racket will try to interpret this as the function that I'm calling. It will say, call the function two, which of course I can't do, this is gonna result in an error, but then call it with plus as the first argument and three is the second. And so if I try to do that, Racket is gonna say application, not a procedure, expected a procedure to be applied to arguments, but instead you gave me two. And so instead, if I wanna write two plus three, I have to write two plus three, and it has to be within these parentheses. All right, and then also, when we define functions in Racket, we're also going to use this prefix notation. And so to define a function in Racket, you always use define, and then you can do open parentheses, and then the function's name, followed by a list of its arguments. All right? There are some other caveats and other ways that we can use to find some sort of special forms that we'll talk about in the future, but that's the first basic one that we're gonna start with. There really aren't too many others. And then note that all of the calls to a user-defined function within Racket code are also always in prefix notation. And so in C++, you might be used to writing something like, for example, calculate slope zero, one, uh, zero, three, two, something like this. This might be sort of very sensible C code. And you can sort of think about, if you want to think about that as in Racket, you can sort of say, well, this first thing right here becomes the function position. And then all of the other things with parentheses between them then just get interspersed, except now that I'm representing list this way, I don't need to actually put the parentheses between them because every time I put a space between these things in a list, Racket is just going to build a list. Okay, and also I would say my preferred style of coding in Racket is that if you have a big, what is called an S expression, one of these big symbolic expressions, a big list of big parentheses, you might be tempted coming from C and C++ background to give each of those parentheses sort of its own new line, like a back brace in C and C++. 
And I'm just going to tell you that generally results in very unreadable code because Racket, just for better or for worse, does have more and more parentheses than C and C++ does. The fact that there is more binding and sort of uh, syntactic structure inherent to C and C++ means that you don't have to write parentheses everywhere. And thus, you'll just have fewer things like braces. And so it's kind of okay to give those uh, their own new line when you're writing in C and C++ and Java-like languages. But in Racket, where you do have to actually type out all the parentheses, I think that in that setting, you really want to be careful to stack all the parentheses up at the end of the line. Okay, so let's talk about some of the basics types in Racket. Okay, so first we've got the numeric tower. So numeric types can gracefully degrade. This is something that's really nice about Racket. Uh, generally, in languages like, for example, C++, you have to allocate a precise amount of space that you want uh, to s the number to be sort of represented in. And then if you overflow that amount of space, you just sort of run out and uh, you're, kind of, you're kind of hosed. Um, but instead, in Racket, you can do things like add, for example, 2 to 1 third, and you'll get back 2 and 1 third as your answer, which is really nice to me. You can sort of mix the different representations, and they have a really, uh, a really nice sort of consistent uh, interpretation. We also have uh, strings and characters. So strings are written in kind of the conventional way uh, you can just use quotes and then type whatever your string is out. I believe Racket supports Unicode and all of that. And then individual characters and code points are supported with this kind of weird notation where you do the uh, sort of hash and then backslash and then the character name. Uh, there are two special booleans in Racket. You should actually remember these. It's uh, pound t, which is true, and pound f. Now, that being said, even though Racket has pound t and pound f, Racket is a dynamically typed language, and there's a notion of what's called truthiness and falsiness. And basically, we're going to talk about this later, but you kind of want to make sure that mostly when you're making results of Boolean expressions and kind of comparing things, you're very careful to use true and false, um, because otherwise it can get sort of confusing. Um, and also there are short circuiting operators of the kind that you might expect, things like AND and OR and whatnot. Uh, and those have the kind of proper sort of short circuiting behavior that we'll sort of talk about. All right, there are two more basic types I want to discuss before moving on. The first one is very important to know about, and this is called a symbol. A symbol is kind of like a string, except it's got a special property. If a symbol foo exists in the system, only ever one single copy of it will exist in memory. This is not the case for strings. If you copy a string, you're actually going to allocate new memory for it in generally when you're using Racket. You could, for example, use intern strings and write a library to do that as well, but the default behavior is just to copy it into a new place in memory. What that means is if you generate a ton of those different strings through different pieces of computation, you could end up eating up memory potentially, although in practice that's not really a big concern. But this is one reason among many that symbols are kind of nice Really, they're just used to indicate the fact that they're kind of syntactic markers for us to use as programmers. Generally, you want to use symbols and strings for very different things. And we'll discuss that as we get a little bit farther towards the course. Uh, and then there's one final form, which is uh, the hash void value. This is produced by the function void, which basically means uh, nothing happened. And that will result from some things like, for example, printing out strings to the console and such. All right, so now we've got an exercise. We've got to compute the sum of the following numbers. So 2 thirds and 1.5. Um, so OK. So we're going to do 2 thirds, which is how we type it in. And it's very important that you write it as 2 divided by 3 rather than 1.5, because when you do 2 thirds plus 1.5, you get something that is what's called inexact. And so now I can type exact, huh? to see if the number, the numeric representation, is captured exactly or not. Now, there's one thing that I really like to point out in this lecture that's actually a very important concept, and it's the notion of what is called a predicate. A predicate is just a single argument function in Racket that's going to return either true or false. This is a really important concept because we're often going to write predicates. For example, you might write, for example, something like, uh, define positive integer huh, as x, and you might say x is a positive integer huh, whenever and integer huh, and by the way, 
when a question mark appears at the end of a predicate, which is the conventional style in racket, we write it and we pronounce it as ha at the very end of it. So this would be integer ha x and greater than x uh, zero. And now we can run this and we can see that positive integer ha 23 is true, positive integer ha negative two is false. All right, now let's look at our next uh, number that we need to fill in. So we need to do three plus eight i, which is a complex number, and three i. All right, so let's try that. We're gonna do three plus eight i and three i. And let's see, we have to enter this as zero plus three i. All right, and we get three plus 11i, and then zero and positive infinity. So we do three plus eight i, and then we have to type it in as zero plus three i. And now we do um, zero plus positive infinity, and that gives us positive infinity. So hopefully this video gave you a, a little bit of an introduction to the ergonomics and sort of the way that you would write code with the Racket programming language. We'll be discussing more specifically about Racket forms and call sites in the next video. All right, so I'll see you there. Thanks.